I want to welcome everyone as usual. But before we get started with everything, I'd like to first hand, hand the screen over to Andrea Seffler, who is going to say a few words about Tony Ribeiro, who has recently passed away. Thank you, Dave. Um, Tony uh, is a long-term fixture of the NMR community. Many of us have known him for many years. Um, and uh, I had the, I was able to attend his service and learn some interesting tidbits. And I wanted to just share a couple of those learnings and uh, some fond memories of him. Um, so Tony uh, was born in Hong Kong. Um, he was uh, an early intellectual bloomer, uh, very fond of science from a young age. And he was actually the driving force of badgering his parents to emigrate to the US to San Francisco. Um, there he attended UCSF for his undergraduate and then went to uh, UCSD for his PhD. And it was during this time that he got involved in uh, what we'll just call the uh, left coast NMR mafia in the form of uh, early Varian days. Um, with that involvement um, and uh, working with one of the first, um, it was either a 200 or a 300 megahertz, I don't recall exactly which one. Um, but uh, nothing we would consider to be high field these days. But with that instrument, uh, he got involved in uh, natural product um, structure elucidation, specifically uh, some prostaglandin work. And, and uh, then in 1984, he got an offer to move to Duke to start uh, an NMR lab there. Um, one did not exist. So um, that's how he moved here to North Carolina, um, which is uh, where I'm located. Um, I got to know him in 1996 when the Duke NMR lab um, uh, got one of the first uh, Varian 800 megahertz instruments. Um, Tony was very involved in the active North Carolina NMR community and opened uh, use of that instrument up to um, anyone that needed access to a high field instrument. Um, and Duke uh, was very supportive of collaborations. So I got to know him quite well. And um, then when I left my uh, NMR uh, connections um, at uh, GSK, the pharmaceutical industry in 2010, um, he was my remaining link to the NMR community. Um, he and I started collaborating on projects and uh, we had what we referred to as our NMR play dates. So I could uh, continue doing fun things in NMR, and we had wonderful times uh, just just pursuing whatever uh, took our fancy and curiosity. So we did some work on pure shift experiments and applications of that, and uh, a lot of work with uh, Krish's uh, craft software and practical applications of that. So um, uh, he'll be very much missed. Um, and. Uh, Thank you. And if you have any questions, uh, we're going to Gary Martin will be posting uh, a little obituary and a link to his official obituary on the MRC website in the next few days. Um, so uh, thank you. And um, uh, we're sorry for the loss. Thank you, Andrea. And for for that nice description of, of Tony, I think the next thing is hand things over to John. Thank you, Dave. And uh, Andrea, thank you very much for those words. Uh, I had known uh, Tony for uh, many, many years. Uh, always, always the gentleman and uh, could, couldn't ask for a nicer person. Anyways, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, welcome to, uh, I think this is uh, Ivan Zoom, Zoom meeting number 23. Uh, wow, time flies. And uh, MR resources and uh, Q1 instruments are uh, certainly very happy to uh, uh, continue sponsorship uh, of these meetings. Uh, we're going to go on and on for uh, uh, quite a long time to come, I can assure you. Uh, MR Resources, of course, have uh, been around for 35 years. Uh, they've been selling a, an awful lot of uh, reconditioned NMRs uh, uh, recently are, uh, and uh, are uh, uh, in need of more inventory, looking to uh, purchase uh, uh, 400s, 500s, and 600 uh, uh, NMR systems with the uh, Shielded magnets, uh, you have anything unused or on hand, uh, please do get in touch. Uh, of course, uh, Q1 Instruments, uh, a bit more of a, uh, a newcomer, but uh, offering a very, very solid uh, uh, product lineup. Uh, Don, would you give us a couple of words on uh, Q1 uh, today? Sure, thank you very much, John. 
we invite you to get to know Q1. Uh, Q1 designs and manufactures complete NMR spectrometers from 400 to 600 megahertz for routine use in the research laboratory. If you'd like to upgrade an older system, either an AS or an ultra shield magnet, Q1 can upgrade to STM probes, uh, preamplifier console and sample changer for less than you think. And it offers un excellent performance at an unbeatable price. Q1's operating environment is Spin Studio J, which has a plug-in based paradigm for extending virtually any capability, either internal or external to the spectrometer via Java-based tools for extending data acquisition analysis and connectivity. A list of the tools increases with every release. And here are a few graphical tools that greatly simplify operation. The smart tune and match facility is fast and easy to use. Just select the nucleus and click start. The automation tools is multi-user with user security and the 3D gradient shimming and 1D gradient shimming is fast and reliable. Shape pulses extend the repertoire of experiments and our patented deep learning and uh, non-uniform sampling technology is unparalleled. Q1 has also innovated the STM probes to have the, first, the world's first multi-platform probe fully integrated into Topspin and VNMRJ platforms. The Q-Link Ethernet-based interface can be installed on a wide range of consoles to fully automate the operation of older NMR systems and add multi-nuclear capability. Want to know more about our consoles, STM probes, and complete systems? Please contact us for a no-risk remote demonstration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Don, and a very solid uh, product lineup, uh, well worth uh, uh, for everyone to uh, have a look at, uh, and a very impressive uh, installed uh, base these days. Uh, anyways, uh, Chris, over to you. Uh, could you give us uh, a little insight on uh, upcoming meetings, uh, if you would, please? Thanks, John. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, I want to talk about uh, what is coming down the pike in Ivan workshops. Uh, Next meeting, uh, you might have already received an email. If not, very soon you will receive an email. Uh, next meeting is on October 21st, uh, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, it will be a panel discussion on F19 NMR in pharmaceutical uh, by uh, David Russell of Genentech. He will be joined by Jose Napolitano, Genentech, Hai Tao Fu, uh, Eli Lilly and Till Marer uh, from Merck. Um, following that, uh, we have lineup of a uh, few other meetings coming up. Uh, Professor Jason Hine from University of British Columbia will lead uh, reaction monitoring by NMR in November. Uh, Dr. Paul Boyer of JOL UK will lead a discussion on benchtop NMR in January. We are taking time, uh, the month off in December due to holidays. Uh, then uh, Dr. Mike Bernstein of Amber Analytical uh, on spectral fitting in February, and Professor Patrick Girardo, uh, University of Nantes, on uh, QNMR beyond 1D proton spectra. Uh, that will be in March. And we are right now looking at uh, post ENC time slot. So with that, I will uh, pass it back to John and hope to see all of you for the upcoming meetings. Thank you, Krish. Uh, very good uh, meeting lineup. And uh, I think all in all, we're uh, uh, more or less scheduled uh, out until, well, gee, almost uh, uh, next uh, uh, ENC time. Just very quick shout out to uh, uh, Gennady over at uh, Genentech. I don't know if uh, Gennady is with us today. Uh, previous speaker from, uh, well, I don't know, three or four meetings ago, uh, I saw that he just published uh, uh, did a solo publication in uh, analytical chemistry uh, on his uh, topic material from uh, 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 his uh, uh, presentation here uh, uh, several meetings ago. Uh, great work, Gennady. Anyways, uh, uh, Dave, back to you if you okay. would like to uh, get things kicked into high gear for us. Okay, great. Well, why don't we get going? And with that, I'll, um, I'll 
Oh, actually, first, before handing it over, I'll mention that our basically our panelists will talk for about uh, the next 45 minutes or so, and then we'll open it up to questions. And uh, during, as most of you know, during the talks, feel free to put your questions in the chat and um, and the panelists will look at that to answer them. So with that, I'll hand things over to Gary Martin and get started with N15 NMR. Looking back, uh, it, it's kind of interesting to be talking about N15 NMR, simply from the standpoint that Ron and I actually started doing this pushing 30 years ago. Uh, I guess I'm starting to date myself. And, you know, Ron's quite fond of showing astrophotography, so I had to compete with Ron. I figured we'd be humming right along today. Uh, this happens to be a hummingbird hawk moth that uh, photographed last month. So at any rate, with that preamble, uh, today we're going to be talking about applications of N15 NMR at natural abundance and structure elucidation studies. Our panel today is Kalindi Morgan from the University of Northern British Columbia. She'll be up first talking about a natural products example. Sang Lin Wang of Amgen will be up next. Uh, he has a very interesting paper that is currently in press in early view of magnetic resonance in chemistry dealing with isotope shifts of N15 signals. Uh, Ron Crouch will be following Sang Lin talking about applications of F19 N15 correlation. And then finally, uh, Misha Rebark of Merck will be closing out the presentation. So with that, uh, I'm going to stop sharing after I flip through a couple more quick slides and pass it on to Kalindi. All right. Hi. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me today. Um, I appreciate it uh, to talk about my research on the um, isolation of piss containing natural products using nitrogen 15 NMR. Um, and so I currently recently um, um, associated with the University of Northern British Columbia. Um, but I, all of the research that I will be uh, oh, just a second talking about today, um, I did at UBC. Um, under the supervision of, um, as, a as a graduate student under the supervision of Raymond Anderson and Katie Ryan. Um, and so um, the interest, so the focus of this um, isolation effort was really on isolating um, natural products that contained uh, piperazic acid or PIS. It's a non-ramosomal amino acid that's found in natural products that are produced um, by bacteria, primarily actinobacteria, which is a uh, sort of a clad of bacteria. And the interest in PIS really comes from um, when they're nitrogen nitrogen bond, 10% of medicinal natural products um, have this nitrogen nitrogen bond in them. And as well, um, of the piperazic acid containing natural products that have been previously isolated, they tend to be associated with bioactivity and also structural complexity. So the hypothesis was is that if we look specifically for PIS containing natural products, there, there might be a likelihood that we'd find both structure, structural complexity as well as um, um, bioactive compounds. And we could access, um, so we could access the um, bacteria that were producing these PIS containing natural products um, because of work done in the Ryan group um, where um, uh, they basically found and characterized the gene or, and the enzyme involved in the cyclization of PIS and the formation of that nitrogen nitrogen bond. Um, and that was, um, that was from work previous, that was building on work previously done in the Walsh group, um, where they showed that the PIS was being produced um, from uh, L ornithine precursor. Uh, and so we used a genome mining approach using the KITS T uh, sequence um, to basically search all sequenced, already sequenced bacteria that um, were gathered on the NCBI database um, to find bacteria that um, had the enzymatic machinery to producing PIS. Though, uh, so the, but then once we did that and we found quite a number actually of bacteria that had unknown gene clusters, um, the question was, is how were we, how was I <laughs> going to isolate those um, PIS containing natural products? 
And, and so one of the things with bacteria that complicates isolation that people probably know is that just because they have a gene cluster um, doesn't mean they're producing it in laboratory conditions. Um, and so sometimes you have to play around with laboratory conditions um, and to see if they're even producing it. And so what I, I started looking at was um, PIS, previously characterized PIS natural products. Um, and um, what I saw uh, was that um, there was quite a number. Um, and so I basically kind of gathered all of the different um, uh, <laughs> literature reported values for PIS, um, both uh, proton and carbon and nitrogen. Um, and I separated them by the deuterated solvent. Um, I know that I wanted to, um, uh, and then I noticed that there was very predictable shifts, um, both for the nitrogen um, the pro, uh, nitrogen attached proton, along with all of the um, other protons of the spin system. And then there's very few um, reported nitrogens, um, but those are in a unique uh, 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 sort of chemical space um, in a 15 and uh, proton 50, uh, nitrogen HSQ NMR experiment. And so um, right away, I uh, thought that I might be able to access um, PIS um, containing natural products using nitrogen NMR. Um, and then as most of you all know, and as uh, discussed, nitrogen NMR, uh, one of the uh, challenges with it is that it has really low natural abundance. Uh, it has a ne negative gyromagnetic ratio, but there are um, experiments that uh, can deal with that. Um, and then um, in natural abundance, we can overcome that limitation um, by feeding uh, st uh, stable isotopes. Uh, and one of the things that also led me in the direction I do want to say is that the nitrogen HSQC experiments, both short range and long, long, long range, were um, actually um, a routine um, part of data set collection for all purified unknown natural products in the Anderson lab. So it actually had a lot of experiment uh, experience uh, gathering that data, and I was familiar with those, uh, particularly the nitrogen um, proton nitrogen HSQC and the proton nitrogen HMQC. And so that, that also kind of led me in this direction. Um, and then of course, the fact that the nitrogen um, has a large chemical shift range, so, um, and not as many nitrogens in natural products. So it's easier to pick out. Um, uh, whereas if proton, for instance, you have a smaller chemical shift range and you have many, many protons all coming up in that um, one spectra. Um, and so, what I really wanted to do is that I wanted to be able to see the nitrogen in a crude extract because I didn't want to, I know the labor that's involved in separating fractions um, and growing bacteria, extracting it um, and separating fractions and only to find um, that it doesn't have that compound that you want. So I really wanted to know right away from growing a small amount of crude that that bacteria was producing in the laboratory conditions. Um, so um, I went to the um, Streptomyces species RJA2928, which was in the Anderson collection, which um, had where it previously isolated pedanamide from, and actually pedanamide was one of the reported nitrogen um, one of the natural products with a reported nitrogen shift. Um, and so um, I grew up a small amount of that. Um, and then I um, basically uh, extracted it, took the ethyl acetate from the extract, dried it on the rotovap and put it into an NMR tube and ran first the 15N HSQC NMR experiment um, and then the um, 15N HSQC toxic experiment. Um, and I should say that I had fed um, labeled L-ornithine, the precursor um, into that streptomyces species. Um, and that really allowed me, one, to see a really clear nitrogen signal in the um, 15N HSQC experiment, but it also allowed me to collect the 15N HSQC toxi, um, and which was really definitive. It gave me the entire sp spin system of PIS and really told me that I had, the, <laughs> that I knew that the, the extract contained those PIS containing natural products. Uh, and so I then knowing that I could use this for um, observe these signals in the crude, I then wanted to explore um, bacteria that had unknown um, gene clusters or gene clusters that were putatively um, producing an unknown compound. Um, and so I uh, kind of honed in on this one particular bioinformatically selected strain, uh, Streptomar Streptomyces incarnatus NRL8089. Um, and it had its gene cluster, it was a PKS and RPS hybrid, um, which um, is typical of the xenothracin type family, which are um, uh, contain PIS, uh, the PIS amino acid. 
and it was, but it was a little bit unique from all the characterized gene clusters. So I hypothesized that um, it was probably producing something new. Um, and then, so this is where I, um, to save a little bit of money, <laughs> um, rather than I knew that I needed to test different growth conditions to see if I could find um, uh, those growth conditions that were producing um, the, where the bacteria was producing that fizz containing natural product. And so in this case, I actually just used, um, I just supplemented with l orn and I didn't actually use the labeled precursor because I could still see that um, uh, the, the, NA, the nitrogen proton correlation in the 59 HSQC experiment was very weak. So I couldn't use it as a definitive signal, but I could use it as a um, punitive that this in these laboratory conditions, the bacteria was possibly producing um, this fizz containing natural product. And then I selected those media for further experimentation and uh, in terms of actually feeding the labeled precursor. Um, and very, again, very simple, uh, grew up small amounts, did the solvent extraction, dried it, put it into an NMR tube and ran first the 15NHSQC and then the 15NHSQC toxic experiment. Um, and so the 15NHSQC toxic experiment was really, um, important in definitively assigning, um, deciding that the extract contained piperizic acid natural products, because although that nitrogen proton correlation is relatively unique um, in the, um, that the chemical shift range of nitrogen proton uh, correlations, it, there are, as I found, other um, Mole, uh, molecules and primary mo uh, metabolites that are have similar nitrogen proton correlations. So you could almost get false positives. And so that 15N HSQC toxi um, took it from a, a maybe to a definitely yes um, in terms of taking that extract and then um, doing further isolation uh, steps with it. Um, and so then um, again, to save money, because um, labeled precursor can get um, expensive and you um, sometimes need to grow a fair amount of bacteria to be able to extract metabolites. And especially in this case where they're very minor metabolites, um, I grew just a, a small amount of labeled um, uh, media and then a larger amount of unlabeled um, uh, media um, just because it just needed that nitrogen signal just to help me with the isolation process. Um, and so I then um, combined the two together, um, extracted them into a larger amount of crude extract, and then began the separation process. So um, uh, ran the 15 HSQC and HSQC toxic experiments, did the partitioning, and then I would run the 15 HSQC first on all of the collection fractions. And then when I saw the signal in the 15 HSQC, I would then run the 15 HSQC toxi to again give that definitive. Um, assignment that it contained PIS. And so I did that sequentially as you would with, for instance, bioassay guided fractionation, except that I was using the nitrogen um, proton and signal and the PIS spin system as my guide through the isolation process. Um, and then once I got off of the HPLC, once I got to the pure compound, um, the, the 15 and HSQC came in handy. I already had that data and it actually really helped with structural elucidation, especially um, the PIS. Um, it turned out that um, although it wasn't bioinformatically predicted, these compounds had three PIS amino acids um, and uh, two of them were very, very close uh, in shifts. Uh, and so the 15 and HSQC toxi and the toxi, um, the proton toxi together um, helped separate really helped to, um, help me assign the chemical shifts to each particular amino, uh, PIS amino acid. Um, just to mention, so this was the incarnatopeptin A. It was very minor metabolite. It was less than one milligram, 58 liters. Um, it lacked a strong chromophore or distinct TLC spot. So the only way I really found it was by testing each of those peaks off of um, the HPLC for that nitrogen signal. And that helped me find it um, from in the isolation process. And um, and then because it does have this sort of unique um, bicyc not sorry, it has this unique bicyclic um, uh, system in the uh, PKS um, portion of the molecule, that was a little challenging to definitively um, assign. With um, we just we tried some long range NMR experiments and we just were not seeing um, any correlations linking, uh, making basically uh, linking. Uh, linking the cyclic system together. Um, and so, uh, but luckily though, um, 
we re-isolated, we needed to get, try to gather a little bit more material to grow more um, bacteria up, re-isolated it. Um, David Williams of the Anderson Lab um, was able to produce the, the methyl ester of the incarnatopeptin A. Um, and then from that more material at the same time, the incarnatopeptin B um, was now isolable and um, both were tested um, against um, the prostate cancer cell lines and the incarnate B, peptin B as, um, as a Depsy peptide uh, was proved to actually be um, an, an active, um, selectively active against the um, uh, LNCCAP uh, prostate, prostate cancer cell line, uh, which is the androgen sensitive um, uh, cell line. And so that was a nice early result. Um, and then I should also mention that there was actually other compounds um, in that extract. Um, in fact, so this was the isolation path um, and this was the final um, peaks um, that showed the nitrogen signal off of the HPLC. Um, and there uh, also they turned out to um, be uh, dentigarymycin F and G, which are um, uh, related, they have the three amino acids, but the um, polyketide portion of the molecule is unique um, from the incarnatopeptin A's and B. Um, these, however, um, in that um, polyketide portion under initial isolation conditions were um, uh, difficult to solve. Um, and so there were some dynamic equilibriums occurring, multiple equilibriums. Um, so that delayed structural elucidation. Um, and only the linear compounds are found, which were not active. Um, and also to note, that these are constitutional isomers of known compounds. And so if one was just using a mass to look for these natural products, they may have very well been missed. Um, so again, that nitrogen 15 really helped um, discover new compounds. Uh, so to conclude, um, utilize that 15N NMR methodology to target the isolation of bioinformatically predicted metabolites. Um, the, uh, the 15N um, HSQC for initial observation of that nitrogen um, proton correlation, and then use the um, 15N HSQC toxi to observe the entire spin system and definitively um, know that I had PIS in my extract or my fraction. Um, and this, um, this process initially uh, has led to the discovery of incarnate to pepsin A and B and then to Gary Mice, Mice and F and G. Um, and um, current uh, work is being done actually using this method on, on different bacteria. Uh, so just um, thank you for uh, listening. I just want to acknowledge um, Dr. Catherine Ryan um, and her group and Dr. Raymond Anderson and the Anderson group, and in particular, um, um, Dr. David Williams and Michael LeBlanc for all their help. Um, in my, the work that I did. Uh, so thank you for listening. Uh, yeah. Thanks for a really interesting presentation, Kalindi. It's interesting to see where the use of N15 has gone from the, the prototypical studies, I guess I'd call them, that Ron and I did so long ago. And it's, it's really, really refreshing to see such a, a creative utilization of N15 for bioassay guided, I guess you'd call it bioassay guided identification of what you're looking for. It's really novel and it's, you know, congratulations on a, a really nice achievement. I'm, I'll be looking forward to that next publication when it comes out. Thank you. We probably have time for one quick question if anybody has any, or you can certainly, um, there's a question from Brendan Duggan, what sort of NMR was being used? It was 600 megahertz. Um... Uh, NMR, uh, Bruker, um, and it was a cryoprobe. Cryoprobes definitely help for N15, for sure. Okay, with that, um, let me pass this on to Sang Lin, and he'll be talking about the utilization of isotope shifts with N15, which is uh, brand new as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I have not seen any prior application of that. So with that said, Sanglin, the show is yours. Today, I want to talk about the application of 1D15 nitrogen and the band selective uh, uh, 2D HSQ and BC to detect the coral isotope effect on nitrogen. Uh, first, I would like to dis uh, discuss use the band selective 2D experiment to illustrate the uh, uncrime moiety in the NS204 impurity and then uh, apply the 1D uh, nitrogen experiment and uh, uh, band selective 2D experiment 
uh, to uh, detect the uncorrelability in the commercial uh, products. So in the uh, uh, pharmaceutical industry, we are interested in uh, illustrating the impurity structures uh, because we need to understand the manufacturing process to control and limit the impurities in the active pharmaceutical ingredients uh, due to patient safety. Uh, here is an example to uh, um, identify MS204. Uh, MS204 is uh, isolated by a semi-prep HPLC column. In the 1D spectrum, uh, we saw uh, there are some leach balls from the HPLC. However, uh, the proton peaks from the uh, MS204 um, are in unique positions for structure illustration. And the uh, in the MS uh, uh, data, um, there is a chloride uh, showing uh, in the formula. Uh, so after analyzing 1D and 2D MMR data, uh, we come up with uh, the structure one uh, as the impurity structure, uh, which has an chloride moiety. Rearranging the uh, chloride um, positions in the molecule can give us the uh, isomer structures, uh, for example, two uh, with uh, uh, an outside moiety, our structure three with a hypochloride uh, moiety. Uh, so then we are thinking that whether we can use the coral isotope effect on nitrogen or on carbon uh, to further uh, differentiate these uh, structures. Uh, in the literature, we know that the, uh, for the coral isotope effect on carbons, uh, cause the carbon uh, to uh, have a uh, carbon peak to split and uh, uh, separation is, is in the PVB range. In the usual 1D proton spectrum, we will not see this kind of splitting. However, uh, in this example here for four coral uh, toluene, uh, we can zoom into the uh, C1 peak here. Uh, when we do the band selective 1D carbon experiment, we can see clearly the uh, C1 peak uh, is split uh, uh, to two peaks with peak ratio three to one due to the coral isotope effect. Uh, however, for a small amount of uh, samples, we need to uh, use 2D experiments. Uh, example here is uh, uh, Professor uh, Moriski's group used the Benzlet 2D proton carbon HSQC experiments uh, to detect the uh, CA uh, carbon, uh, which has a coral attachment, and, and this carbon has uh, um, uh, two uh, uh, separated peaks due to coral isotope uh, shifts. And the molecule is in the nanomolar, uh, nanomolar scale uh, nature product. And Dr. Uh, Sari and uh, his colleagues at Merck extended this technology to uh, detect uh, quaternary carbons that has a coral attachment. Uh, the use of uh, band selective uh, 2D uh, Proton carbon clip HSQ, HSQ and BC uh, uh, here uh, can uh, uh, detect the methyl to the C6 uh, in this uh, um, example here. Uh, the C6 has uh, um, chloral isotope uh, uh, splittings and uh, uh, has, uh, shows two peaks here in these examples. So for our case study, uh, we want to use uh, proton nitrogen, uh, HSQ and BC uh, to our sample. And the sequences here is simple. It's simply an, an adaption from the proton carbon uh, HSQ and BC experiment. Uh, when we perform the experiment, uh, we uh, uh, optimize the long range uh, proton to nitrogen uh, couplings and the D1 values so that the first record of the HSQ and BC has the maximum intensity. And if the proton rareness of interest is coupled to other protons, then we will use the 180 degree selective pulse to selectively excite the proton peak uh, in the uh, in that step. So magnetization evolution due to the jet uh, couplings uh, is refocused. 
The final 90 degree nitrogen pulse uh, is used to purge the antiphase turns. So, so uh, using the um, echo and anti echo skin and the gradient to select metallizations results in the uh, absorptive line shape for the 2D uh, detection. So for our, our MS204 example, uh, we first observe the proton to nitrogen correlations uh, from the H9 to N5 in the HMBC. And then we zoom into the um, nitrogen uh, dimension at uh, 295.7 ppm. In the, in the nitrogen dimension, we have uh, uh, the bandwidth is uh, 0 0.5 ppm with uh, 64 uh, increments. And uh, um, we use linear prediction in the processing for the nitrogen dimension. Uh, in the proton dimension, we use uh, 0 0.8 ppm bandwidth uh, with 256 points. Uh, in this example, we use a uh, um, uh, 40 millisecond Gaussian pulse to, selective, to selectively excite the H9 peak at 2.48 ppm. And the result shows uh, uh, the nitrogen peak is split uh, uh, into two peaks due to the Cora isotope effects. And the splitting is uh, about 20 uh, ppb. So from this data, uh, we proved that the structure of MS204 is one. Uh, we also perform uh, the uh, carbon selective carbon experiments on the C2 uh, carbon. Uh, we, we only see a symmetric peak for the C2. So this will rule out the uh, structure of MS204 uh, for the uh, number two structure. After we have done these experiments, we, are, uh, we want to apply the techniques to uh, commercially available compounds uh, to further verify uh, these techniques can detect the n chloride moiety. The first example tested is uh, 1,3-dichloro-5,5-dimethylhydrotoin. And the molecule is supposed to have two uh, uh, n chloride uh, moiety. So in spectrum A here, uh, in the, for, the, for this particular experiment, we use long range coupling, uh, NH equal to six Hertz, uh, 25 mg per meter of sample. And within an hour, we see a, a N1 peak is split uh, into two peaks. Uh, due to the uh, Cora isotope effect. And the, the separation is about 16 ppb. Uh, in spectrum B here, we try to observe the uh, method to the N4. Uh, uh, however, uh, for this uh, uh, coupling here, uh, we need to set the JNH equal to one hertz, a very small coupling. And so we need to use a high concentration of sample, about 100 mg per meter, and uh, and after one day of data acquisition, we observed M4 is symmetric. So we think that the M4 has the NH groups uh, as a major component uh, in the sample. Uh, we, uh, we also acquired the 1D nitrogen experiment uh, on, on, uh, for this molecule uh, using the BBO choir probe. Uh, we optimized the realization uh, delay uh, 105 seconds between scans. Uh, after six hours, the, the, the 1D spectrum shows nicely and the 1D data, 1D nitrogen data it, it is the same as the 2D data. Uh, for this molecule, because we did not observe the n chloride uh, moiety uh, flanked by two carbonyl uh, carbons, so we choose the uh, two different uh, uh, molecules to, to further testing the, 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 the moiety here, n succinamide and n theramide. And for this uh, experiment, we observed the n has the splitting uh, about uh, 11 ppb. For n um, because uh, this is a five bond coupling from proton to nitrogen, the uh, wrong range proton to nitrogen coupling was set to one hertz in the experiments. And uh, uh, we use uh, 80 mix per meter of the sample. Uh, the data acquisition is one, uh, about one day. 
We also dissolve ankylotherma in different solvents. Uh, the stability limit at temperature for chloroform is about 46 mg per mil, for DMF is about 78 mg per mil. Uh, the, in the proton dimension, the peak separations of uh, uh, these uh, two peaks uh, decreases from 115 hertz in the pyridine to 67 hertz in chloroform and 11 hertz in the DMF. In previous slide, we showed that we can acquire the 2D uh, spectrum of the uh, pyridine uh, when the peaks were separated by 115 hertz. However, if we apply the same experiments for the samples in chloroform, uh, it's, it's, it's very difficult to acquire such 2D data set. However, if we uh, put these three samples uh, into the um, PBO cryo probe to acquire 1D nitrogen data, uh, we see very nice uh, uh, splittings of the M15 peaks uh, for all three samples. So in conclusion, uh, we can apply the 1D uh, nitrogen and band selective 2D uh, HSQC and BC experiment to illustrate the uncry moiety in molecules. The successful, the successful results uh, depend on the structure of the market itself, the solvent, and the stability of unchloride moiety. And, and we need a sufficient intensity to show the spread of nitrogen peaks about three to one ratio due to the chloride isotope effect. Uh, finally, I would like to thank my colleagues at the uh, engine to work on this project together. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks for an interesting presentation, Sang Lin. It will be interesting to see uh, what other applications of isotope shifts begin to show up for uh, nitrogen as well as other applications. Uh, I don't see any questions in the chat at the moment. Uh, so, and I, I did put in the chat the DOI information for Sang Lin's paper that's in press and MRC in case you missed it uh, as the slides went by. And with that, uh, I'd like to hand over to Ron to talk about N N15 F19 correlation work. Ron? Uh, hey, Gary, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, is good, okay, okay. Well, anyway, the title here uh, is Adventures with N15 Fluorine. And it's great to be here, great to be back at Ivan. Now, there's some fundamental things to talk about at the very beginning. And the first thing really is that there's no real difference between fluorine nitrogen and proton nitrogen long range correlations other than the couplings that are involved. And in the presence of protons, a, a very key point to keep in mind is that you're going to have coupling the protons. And so you can do uh, F1 or F1, F2 decoupling of protons and simplify the, the long range fluorine nitrogen, but this is always destructive. So it, it's really useful information. I hope to show that. Now, the value of the couplings is uncertain. So if, if do some experiments, expect some surprises. There's no magic with pulse sequences, but I would say that HSQNBC being phased in both dimensions might provide better line shape and inherently better resolution like LRHSQNBC. And now also it's impossible to talk about fluorine nitrogen without talking also about proton carbon and proton nitrogen. It's what Dave Russell refers to as the chocolate chip cookie principle. We have a whole lot of data that goes into doing structures and it's impossible to pull these out separately without considering them as a a set. So anyway, uh, finally, an observation, recent observation following up on the previous talk is that isotope shifts might in fact be diagnostic. So uh, it's a whole lot of references available, but I'll limit it to only three and one for small molecule, one for solids and one for bio. So here's a very nice old paper from 2002, which points out that uh, accordion style uh, long range excitation can be useful with fluorine nitrogen because of the range of the coupling constant. 
There's a very nice solids reference here. I understand a little bit of it. And then a nice biomolecular NMR about hydrogen bonds. So let's take a look at a, a typical proton nitrogen, HMBC. So this is using voriconazole. This is data I acquired, I believe, 2017. So there's a wealth of information that's here. And traditional wisdom in, HM, in nitrogen HMBC in particular is you don't need a whole lot of resolution in F1 because the spins are diverse. But in this particular case, this is not true. We have three nitrogens in less than two parts per million of space. So attempting to acquire this at very, very low resolution is problematic. Now I've circled to call out one correlation, which is assigned as a five bond J from the OH to the pyrimidine one. And in fact, it is probably the result of a hydrogen bond and a through space correlation would be my best guess of what could possibly be going on there. Now, if we take a look at fluorine nitrogen on the same molecule, and again, running at sufficient resolution to resolve these peaks, which are close together, we in fact see from F3, these two. So there's really no surprises. The parameterization in this particular case I was uh, really fat, dumb, and happy. I just pretended it was proton carbon and used something like seven hertz. Now, I'm going to show a few slides. And through here, I'm going to look through a series of five, uh, five different isomers of fluoropyridines. OK, this data is all acquired in 2017. And so it was acquired at that time with no uh, uh, particular goal in mind other than, gee whiz, wow, we can do proton, fluorine, uh, proton at the same time. OK. So here's a look at the first example molecule, the 2,3-difluoro with a 4-trifluoromethyl molecule. So we're looking, of course, the proton spectrum without and with fluorine decoupling. Here is the fluorine spectra for the just showing you the three resonances. And a key thing to observe is the broadening of the fluorine that is next to the Pareto nitrogen here. This is a uniform uh, case. And again, the carbon spectrum with, with just proton decoupling and with dual decoupling. So if we take a look at this molecule, and we look at a proton carbon HSQC, what we see is what's expected. We see the long range correlations, but they're modulated in addition by the, the, the fluorine coupling. So this correlation shows a coupling from, what, from the trifluoromethyl at the same time, but we can apply fluorine decoupling uh, to this in evolution in this particular case, only evolution, I believe, and we can remove these coupling. This is a useful thing to do when you're involved with fluorine, but bear in mind, it is destructive. So if we look at the fluorine nitrogen, uh, HMBC, on that same molecule, parameterized with seven hertz J, the, we're looking at projections here, we see a very nice correlation between the two fluorines and the nitrogen. And I, I'm recording the chemical shifts relative to ammonia being at zero ppm rather than nitromethane. Um, it's more of a bio-based reference thing. So if we change the optimization to 12 hertz, we're seeing peaks, but they're a little bit weaker. But remember that we had a carbon, a, a proton, nitrogen HMBC to look at. And if we acquire this without evolution decoupling, lo and behold, what we see is that the one bond cup, the two bond J between the fluorine two and the nitrogen is in fact 59 Hertz. So the choice of optimiz optimizing the uh, J's based on typical proton nitrogen numbers is uh, not necessarily gonna get you anywhere. Uh, but it, it worked with 7 hertz, it worked with 12 hertz, which is a curious observation. Now, looking at this data, which was acquired in 2017, in hindsight, I add the note needs more increments. Well, we have plenty of resolution to resolve the 2 bond J, but with many, many more Y points, we could probably measure the coupling constant from this nitrogen, this fluorine to this nitrogen through proton nitrogen, HMBC. Now let's look at another isomer where all we've done is walk the trifluoromethyl one carbon over. We see the same general trends uh, here. The, 
the fluorine that is adjacent to the nitrogen is again very broad, whereas his other partner is quite sharp. The couplings are large. We're looking on the order of 25 hertz. And when you realize that the fluorine fluorine J is 25 hertz, the possibility that the uh, long range J is on the order of 50 hertz makes for a situation that's rather different than uh, uh, we're used to considering a proton situation. Again, the simplification afforded by doing dual decoupling is dramatic in this case, the, the end just, just proton decoupling and the dual. Again, if we look at the proton nitrogen H and BC, we see that the fluorine J is approaching 58 hertz, two bond. We're not seeing any evidence of the three bond J, one, two, three, yeah, two, three bond J from, the, from that fluorine in this particular case. So we'll move to another isomer. This time we've, we put fluorines adjacent, both of them adjacent to the nitrogen. Again, the fluorines remain broad being adjacent to nitrogen. And in the HM proton nitrogen HMBC, we see sort of a triplet structure, large J coupling constant, very, very weak. We look at fluorine nitrogen optimized at 12 hertz, even though the J is closer to 60 hertz in this particular case, we still see correlations, which is really quite a surprise. And this mean, this is really, you see, it's weak data. We're really getting down to the noise level at this particular point. But the problem is that at the time I'm acquiring it, I just queued up a bunch of stuff with no knowledge of it. This was just an overnight random run for all the data we're looking at right now, back in 2017. So finally, to get something that's really pretty different, let's move the fluorines over here to where they're really quite isolated. Now, both fluorines are, the fluorine is in fact sharp at this case, in, in this particular case. We have a significant coupling to the trifluoromethyl. You see it as a quartet. Um, we look at the proton nitrogen, a very nice result, a final isomer here. Again, returning to moving the fluorine to the three position and the trifluoromethyl here, we now retain the very broad fluorine adjacent to nitrogen. And here's the proton carbon um, experiment. Again, showing the, all of the coupling constants. If we look at proton nitrogen, we see, in fact, again, we're looking at a 50 Hertz J between two bond here. We're not seeing any evidence of coupling here with this particular optimization, which was done probably on the order of 12 Hertz or so. Now let's look at pulse sequences and think about things a little bit. This is really sort of a normal uh, uh, phase in F1 uh, HMBC adiabatic pulse sequence. If we're going to be decoupling fluorine, you can do it by just, a, just putting a simple fluorine bit pulse in the center of evolution. But it's based on some work that was done by Peter Sandor and Krish many, many years ago at, at, um, at, at Agilent. It was found that sometimes it's, it's useful to use the staggered pulses like this, dividing into the uh, evolution time to get effective decoupling. And when we do that, you see it can work very well. This is a mixture of these floral pyrido isomers. This is just the proton carbon HMBC, and we see all of the, the wealth of the coupling. But if we do the decoupling in that mode, now we see tremendous simplification. So it's a spectrum that's easier to so look at and sort out. I've left the one bond J's because, because I like to see them. Uh, it's nice, but again, bear in mind, it's destructive. We're losing coupling information. Now, if we take a look at a mixture of these molecules, this is a 24 hertz optimization on an HMBC fluorine nitrogen on a mixture of these four isomers here. Uh, again, what we already know from looking at them individually is they span a significant range in chemical shifts as we walk the fluorines away from the pyrido nitrogen. We're looking at nearly a 90 ppm shift in position here. 
And the, this is, this is our projections through the 2D here. So you see it's pretty reasonable data and it was in fact decoupled in both dimensions to simplify it. Now, recently uh, we, we published a paper, it's in press now where we talk about fluorine carbon adequate. And a part of that was the isotope shifts. So if we look at this molecule, this uh, perfluoroaromatic molecule, and just consider the fluorine carbon HMBC, what you notice is that the shift is that the peaks are wonky when we look through F2. They are in fact shifted in position significantly from being dead on in a straight. And what's actually happening here is an isotope shift observed on the fluorine. And the trend is the two bond J in the HMBC has a stronger isotope shift than anything else. So we can, in this particular case, probably be able to reach a point to where using fluorine at least, we can reliably look at the F2 chemical shift in the long range correlation and have a pretty good information understanding, is it a two-bond J or is it something else? So if we take a look at this same data and process it and look at it, I'm not showing you with the regular fluorine spectrum on top, I'm just using the same 2D. We in fact see on the order of a 19 part per billion isotope shift for the position of the fluorine for these in 22. And in the case where there's no fluorine adjacent to nitrogen, the shift is only 10 parts per billion. So it's looking as if it's possible that, for, that the F2 isotope shift of the fluorine spectrum can give us structural information in nitrogen. Is it two bond or is it something else? So that's really uh, kind of where I went uh, to with that. I was glad to see that result that there's some consistency. Now I put a box in some uh, carbon long range uh, proton carbon experiments, looking at the fluorine carbon coupling constants that are involved. And what we see in this particular molecule is that the fluorine that's here shows a very nice five bond across to this nitrogen, the, the nitrile in the 10 position. And the two bonds tend to be really large, 20 Hertz. The long range off of, uh, to the three are uniform and very small. So this is an HSQMBC that at the time was randomly optimized at 10 hertz on the same molecule. And I folded the N7 uh, peaks here to try to get enough resolution to resolve the two nitriles. And I'm just barely able to do this. I can just see the resolution of the N11 and the N13. And we see right on the surface, the, the correlations between them, the F2, us presumed to 11 and the F5 presumed to 13. If we go a little bit deeper into the same data and take a look at it, what we see is indeed there is a six bond correlation, fluorine nitrogen from the six fluorine all the way across to the 11. And you clearly see at this the resolution of the two nitrile carbons. So there's a wealth of information to be obtained from fluorine nitrogen. Is it going to solve a structure for you on its own? Absolutely not, unless you're just a perfluoro system. So consider all the data at once, the proton and the fluorine data, and leverage the proton data to measure the fluorine coupling constants. So conclusion. Um, Traditional wisdom, fluorine nitrogen long range doesn't need many increments because the chemical shift tends to be dispersed. Uh, that's a bad idea in the sense that if you want to look at measuring coupling constants, you want to get your, your resolution up in the Y dimension when you're looking at the carbon experiment. And when you return the nitrogen, you may in fact find that there are peaks that are closer together than you would think, as in the case of the boriconazole. Uh, all of this data, except some of the recent fluoro, uh, perfluoro aromatic, was acquired in 2017. And honestly, it should be reacquired at much higher resolution in both X and Y dimensions to sort out the fluorine coupling constants and also to really accurately measure the induced isotope shifts. So by and large, what I have done in hindsight is presented to you a bunch of really crappy data 
that only when looking at it through a lens of four years of consideration, you can go back and correct the mistakes. So uh, many acknowledgements to speak of with Ashok, uh, Krishna Swami, and Joel, and, and Tim Bergeron. Uh, Tim, in fact, has taken many of these uh, X, Y, Z, long range and, and, and direct uh, HX correlation experiments and ported them into a very nice automation file that people can routinely use. I have to call out Peter Sandor and Krish in the idea of the idea of the multiple staggered decoupling, which can be useful when fluorine is involved. And finally, Mike Fry, at, still with Joel USA, uh, who uh, actually ordered these materials and said, hey, Juan, take a look at them and see what you see. This was back in 2017. So in closing, an update from the observatory. Uh, this is pushing 70 hours of total acquisition at this particular time. It's hydrogen alpha and oxygen three. And it ends up this bizarre squid structure is only in oxygen three and it's embedded in this large nebula here. And so at the stage I'm at, I call it squid from hell because it's incredibly weak and it's incredibly difficult to process. Um, so with that, I think I'll pass the baton. Thanks for an interesting presentation, Ron. There's one question in the chat from Brendan Duggan about uh, spectral widths. You want to take that, Ron? Uh, sure. Uh, well, when, when we run the fluorine experiment, uh, in particular, these uh, fluoro uh, pyridines were fairly close together and it is not particularly demanding. But in general, I run the HMBCs with fluorine observe. I'll always use a BIP pulse in the middle of the fluorine evolution time so that I, I can light up a pretty wide window. I can certainly get a couple of hundred ppm of fluorine quite reliably in a long range fluorine carbon or fluorine nitrogen. So far as nitrogen is concerned, the same strategies are involved there. I tend to use bit pulses on in the fluorine for 180s and can cover really quite a wide wide, wide window, probably 300 ppm easily. So giving the wide range of, of, of uh, nitrogen in particular, you probably want to understand the chemistry and set your windows rather than try to go after the whole world. Thanks for the update on that, Ron. Uh, one other question that was posed to Kalindi that I'll mention briefly was the question of N15 chemical shift referencing. Uh, for the most part, things right now are either referenced to nitromethane or the protein community tends to reference to ammonia. Uh, personally, I've used ammonia because I would rather have things downfield than upfield in my reference. One thing to keep in mind, if you're looking at data for N15 that have been referenced to nitromethane, a few years back, IUPAC changed the sign convention. Um, since almost everything is upfield of nitromethane, all of the chemical shifts in the old literature used to be negative in sign. They flipped the convention. Now you'll see things that are upfield of nitromethane being listed as a positive chemical shift. So just be careful. Um, and with that, let me pass the baton to Misha for whatever you'd care to say, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Gary. Uh, I want to thank Gary and Krish and Ivan organizers first for inviting me to be a panelist and then for letting me stay in the lineup uh, despite the fact that my legal department, you know, due to the circumstances beyond our control, put my talk on a legal hold. So unfortunately, I won't be able to present anything, but I'll say a couple of words. Uh, thank you to all the presenters today. We've seen really different uh, applications of N15 NMR, and I would say pretty impactful in real life. Uh, my presentation was supposed to be about applications of N15 NMR uh, in uh, pharmaceutical industry and uh, specifically for structural elucidation. And, um, it's certainly N15 NMR, especially nowadays with cryoprobes, uh, is 
definitely affordable experimentally with you know, reasonable sample amounts, single digit milligrams. And uh, I can tell that it's, it's being used uh, extensively, at least in Merck uh, NMR uh, group. Uh, we use long range NMR and uh, 15 NMR uh, experiments all the time, uh, whether it's HMBC or HSQ MBC, uh, dif different uh, versions of it. And uh, in some cases, uh, relatively difficult uh, to, to distinguish uh, structures by any other method would be absolutely trivial by N15 chemical shift. For example, uh, imagine, hypothetically speaking, hydroxylamine versus hydroxylamine, the chemical shift difference in nitrogen would be uh, tremendous. It would be three to 400 ppm, uh, could miss that but it would be very difficult for majority of other methods to distinguish uh, such things. And uh, with that, back to you, Gary, thank you. One other thing that I'll add to what Misha just discussed, uh, N15 is also an excellent way to pin down which nitrogen, if you've got several of them in a molecule has undergone N-oxidation as a potential process uh, degradation product. Uh, I'd like to thank all of the speakers for a very, very interesting and diverse set of presentations. I think this is, you know, it's interesting to watch how N15 NMR applications at natural abundance have matured over the, the past nearly 30 years since we first started playing around with those experiments when Ron and I were both at Burroughs Welcome. Uh, and if there's any questions, um, you can put them in the chat. And with that, I guess I'm handing the, the baton back to David Rice. Okay, well, um, thank you everyone for a, uh, for a very um, interesting uh, set of talks with a lot of uh, new stuff, certainly for me. And uh, so uh, with that, let me hand things over to John for some last words. Okay, Re re receiving five by nine, as they say. Th th thank you, Dave. Uh, thank you, Gary, and uh, our, our other uh, speakers as well today. Very, very uh, good, solid subject matter, uh, as we always try to do with our uh, ongoing Ivan meetings. And uh, thank you for all of those who uh, participated and uh, uh, joined us in these uh, uh, talks and uh, lectures, I, I may say. Uh, we've got uh, next meeting uh, scheduled for, uh, I believe, uh, October 21st on uh, 19F in uh, pharmaceuticals. Uh, once again, uh, I think will be uh, some very, very interesting uh, uh, talks and presentations. But uh, uh, just to everyone uh, who participated today, thank you very much. And uh, Dave, back to you. Do you have any uh, uh, closing remarks for us? Well, I guess uh, I guess one one thing I should mention is that about a month ago, um, John and Eric decided to uh, buy this uh, very nifty gavel for me that some of you have probably seen before. So I, in fact, get to close the meeting with a uh, with with a real gavel. So I thank everyone for being here, and I'll hit the gavel. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, Krish. Take care. Thank you.